Hello, I am Dr. Lee Ham, Senior Vice President and Dean of the Tulane University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining the Tulane COVID-19 or Coronavirus Pandemic Medical Update. Coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, has changed our lives. A few weeks ago, this virus was a seemingly distant overseas problem, but now it's a U.S. reality, it's a New Orleans reality, with real-world impact on our community, our health care providers, our health systems, and as you are well aware, our daily lives. Given the relatively recent emergence of coronavirus, there are many unknowns about this disease, its transmission, and its treatment. Tulane School of Medicine has a long and distinguished history of being on the forefront of combating emerging diseases in our region. Actually, Tulane started addressing an infectious disease over 150 years ago. Our commitment to and efforts in combating the coronavirus pandemic is no exception. With our mission focused on cutting edge research, preparing the next generation of clinical and scientific leaders, and healing patients in our community, we will host a weekly update to provide you current information and address your questions. Tulane University is uniquely positioned to combat this challenge in New Orleans, the region, and throughout the world. We have leading physicians and scientific experts at the School of Medicine. We also have experts at the Tulane National Primate Research Center, the School of Public Health, and the School of Science and Engineering. Our recent efforts in treating patients and advancing the science to combat other infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, HIV, Ebola, and Zika here in the U.S. and internationally are well known. Given the negative impact of this current pandemic, both for our community and our most vulnerable, we are embracing this challenge at Tulane and are making headway in many areas. I'm Patrick Delafontaine, Executive Dean of the School of Medicine. The Tulane COVID-19 Medical Update provides a forum to reach out to our community, share updated information, demystify the science, and engage you in our quest to stop the spread and negative impact of this virus. As we speak, Tulane physicians and healthcare providers are on the front lines taking care of patients in our region who are infected with the coronavirus. Fortunately, we have more than 30 specialists in the areas of adult and pediatric infectious diseases, adult and pediatric pulmonary diseases, and critical care available to treat these patients. Our doctors are already taking care of patients, and you will get to hear directly from them. In addition to the hospitals and clinics that they are working in, they are advising hospitals and clinics throughout the region. Also, Tulane scientists are working around the clock to address not only the current crisis, but the future problems this virus may cause. They are developing novel testing techniques that will identify infected individuals more rapidly to prevent the spread of the disease. They are developing a vaccine to prevent the disease in the future. And they are developing novel treatments for this infection. Please send your questions and comments to medquestions at tulane.edu. We will work with our team of experts to provide regular updates and answers. I'm Sharon Courtney, and we're talking to Dr. David Mouchette, who's on the front lines of treating patients for COVID-19. Are there times we need to be specifically vigilant about whether we might have gotten coronavirus? Well, yes, Sharon, of course. So if you have been exposed to somebody with proven COVID-19, then of course it behooves you to uh, contact your provider and discuss with them whether or not testing is appropriate. Other situations where it might be important would be if you've been to an area that has a high prevalence of the infection, i.e. where you, we are hearing that there are a lot of cases. 
then you need to be more vigilant. And certainly if you're 65 and older, if you have chronic diseases like diabetes, liver disease, immune compromised conditions, then you also want to be more vigilant. If I think I've been exposed, what are the common symptoms of COVID-19? Okay, so if you think you've been exposed, you're going to be looking for symptoms such as fever, which is seen in 85 to 90 percent of people, but also maybe a dry cough and even some shortness of breath. And then occasionally some people will have symptoms such as muscle aches and pains and fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, sneezing, all these other kind of symptoms. So unfortunately, it does look a lot like the cold, the flu, or allergies, and that's what gets tricky. If I have a cough, what should I do? So if you only have a cough, you're probably a little less likely to have it, but some people have the cough and don't have the fever, and some people have the fever and don't have the cough. So if you have either cough, fever, or shortness of breath, you do have to think about the possibility. Again, the best thing is to contact your provider. I'm getting emails from patients in portal um, emails on the electronic medical record for these kinds of questions. It's a great way to handle um, the, the, these questions and to educate our community and our patients uh, as to how to proceed. What should I do if someone around me coughs? Do they need to go home? Well, if somebody around you coughs, first of all, um, you need to educate them to cough away from you, to cough into their sleeve or into a tissue. So we need to teach each other how to be better um, infection control people. Number two, if they're coughing and it's new and has been going on for months, then yes, they probably need to go home and contact their provider to see if anything further needs to, to be done. So educate, tell people to go home, and again, social distancing is the key thing here. Make sure that if, if somebody is coughing that you're keeping six feet away. That will likely protect you. Tell us what steps Tulane is taking to protect patients and help identify those who may be positive. Right, so by Tulane, I think we probably mean, for example, Tulane Hospital, which only medical center. So um, very early on, we implemented screening of everybody coming in through um, a, limb, a restricted access. So some of the entrances are, have been closed, and there's uh, restrictions on where you can access the inside of the hospital. There are screeners there that are asking you, have you had a fever? Do you have a cough? If people do, they're turned away. So. They started this very early on, and I think this is going to make a big difference. But in addition, there's, it's, access is more restricted. The other thing to keep in mind is that we are limiting visitors. We have a visitor's policy, which limits um, visitation uh, to as few people as possible and to essential visitors. What steps is Tulane taking to protect its own health care workers? So from early on, we started educating our health care workers about the illness, about social distancing, about the importance of hand washing, um, not touching our faces, um, you know, taking good care of ourselves, and most importantly, we've educated our healthcare workers quite thoroughly on how to use PPE or personal protective equipment. And that's, for example, a gown, gloves, face mask, eye protection, all the things that healthcare workers use when they're seeing somebody who does have this virus. And so we've done a lot of simulations, trainings, emails, email blasts, videos, et cetera, to teach people how to do this. Um, we're always available for questions. Infection prevention um, is headed up by a professional, it has staff, including a physician, who also are educating our employees uh, as to how best to protect themselves. Speaking of masks, are N95 masks worth it? And should I get one? So don't go looking for and hoarding masks, okay? They're a double-edged sword. An N95 mask is a great thing for a healthcare worker to have in the hospital if they're seeing a suspected case or a proven case because it probably does provide the best protection to the healthcare worker. For people out in the community, we're not recommending that they wear masks unless the public health authorities or the hospital has um, told them to wear the mask because they were discharged from the hospital with the infection. And the reason, there's several reasons. Number one is that the regular surgical masks are no longer, available, no longer available. They've been taken off the store shelves. They may or may not work as well as N95s. And the other problem with a surgical mask is if you wear it, do you really know how to take it off in a safe manner without infecting yourself? And our fear is that people will put these on, they'll touch them, the virus will get on the outside, perhaps from somebody coughing near them. And then when they take the mask off, they're going to contaminate their hands, and then they're going to touch their eyes, nose, and mouth and get infected. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Bottom line is the more important thing is the social distancing, stay home if you're sick, 
but don't go out and buy up all these masks. And honestly, you won't be able to find them because they're in very short supply. Who should be tested and how do we get tested? Great question. And that's a very fluid situation. We are looking at more options uh, in, in the coming weeks. Bottom line is, if you are sick, i.e. you have fever and or cough and or shortness of breath, uh, and you live in a place where COVID-19 has already been reported, which is many places around the United States, including New Orleans, then you need to contact your healthcare provider. The first thing I would say is take a deep breath and, and don't panic, okay? If you have symptoms, it's just as likely that you have the flu or the common cold or something else. But we do need to have a lower threshold for considering testing. So you call your provider and your provider, whether it's your nurse practitioner, your nurse, your doctor, whoever, is going to give you instructions. Getting testing right now for the general public is not easy, but it is becoming increasingly available. It will be uh, available very shortly through um, the federal um, joint venture with, uh, it's a public private venture where people will be able to do drive up testing in the parking lots of places like Walmart. Um, this is being staffed by public health uh, officials and others uh, and this will allow more testing. Um, here at Tulane we are working on some testing for our people that would allow people to drive up um, and there are other sites around the, the city that are beginning to ramp this up. The bottleneck right now is that there are not enough of the tests and the uh, kits that include a swab and a little test tube with liquid medium in it to actually perform as many tests as we would like. So we're waiting for the supply chain um, in the United States to uh, produce and uh, deliver more of these kits. And at the same time, the testing um, companies such as LabCorp, Quest, Tulane's Hospital, all the different hospitals and other labs are also working and ramping up testing. The good news is that one of the big companies, Roche, has gotten FDA approval to send out their tests that allows hospitals to do hundreds of tests uh, daily. How long is it from exposure to feeling sick? So it's, it's uh, somewhere in the uh, vicinity of 2 to 14 days. That's what we call the incubation period. That means the time from when you get exposed to the virus until the time that you, you know you're sick, okay, whether it's the fever or cough or, or what have you. Um, on average, it's about five to seven days, if that gives people a little better idea. So you can kind of think about almost a week that it takes. There's always going to be some outliers. Everything in medicine and biology, for the most part, is a bell-shaped curve. What that means is that 95% of people behave in a typical way, and 5 or 10% of people don't behave in a, and are a little bit unusual. So 2 to 14 days is a good rule of thumb. How long are people contagious? How long before people start to feel sick? And how long before they start to feel better? Well, those are tough questions to answer, and these are um, parameters that um, scientists and doctors are looking at and we'll have more information about in the coming months. Um, you know, in general, if you, uh, if you get sick, you're probably looking at um, re recovery time of one to two weeks, but it, it can vary. There are some people that get better in five days and some people who take three or four weeks to get better. It probably depends on how sick you are. If you're not as sick and you never get really sick, it's quite likely that you will get better. We don't know for sure how long people are contagious for. It's probably, again, the same concept. If you're super sick, you probably have more virus that you can transmit, so you're more contagious. Therefore, you may be contagious longer. If you're not as sick, perhaps not as long. We don't know exactly. But to give you some sense of, of the timelines here, um, if somebody gets sick and they have a positive test, the um, public health officials ask that we test them in seven days. And if they're negative in seven days, then we get one more test at least 24 hours later. And if that's negative, then we can say that, they are, that they've cleared the infection and they're probably not very contagious. So you're actually treating many of the local patients. Are any of them getting better? Yes, um, a lot of them, probably most of them are getting better. Um, some, a few are still critically ill. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing, you know, in general, people are stable, getting better. Remember, um, the vast majority of people, at least 80 to 85 percent of people who are diagnosed with this infection either have no symptoms, very, very mild, or just mild symptoms and do very well. But it's that 10 or 15 percent of people, perhaps 20, up to 20 percent, who are sicker, who require hospital admission. And then not all those people have to go to the intensive care unit. Just a fraction of those people get super sick requiring ICU care. We'll learn more about this in the coming months. And one of the things to remember is that 
Just because the disease behaved a certain way in China doesn't mean it's going to behave exactly the same way in other places. And we are seeing some differences. And, and those are things that thankfully due to um, the ready access to data, to the internet, it's much easier to compile this data than ever in the history of, of medicine and science. I'm flabbergasted at how quickly uh, the Chinese and other um, groups that have seen the virus earlier than us are getting their data out and getting it published. This is absolutely uh, unheralded um, uh, in, in our history to see data coming out in, in just a few weeks. Why are younger people not getting as sick as the older patients? That's a great question, Sharon, because of course we're all hearing that young people and children don't seem to either get the virus or if they get it, they don't seem to be very sick. The problem is that there's some evidence that they might be carriers or spreaders. So they may be able to handle the infection better and not get sick, but they could potentially be contagious. And because young people like to get out and hang out with each other and are very mobile and often feel invincible, they may be more prone um, to taking uh, chances and potentially spreading the virus. So I think that that is part of the reason why we're closing schools, encouraging young people not to congregate, at, you know, hanging out at bars and going to parades and things like that. But at least the, the silver lining here is that it seems as though young people and children in particular do really well, which is rather different from other viruses such as the influenza virus. So maybe a small silver lining uh, there. Should we be out of our homes unless it's absolutely necessary? For example, is it a good idea to go for a walk in the park or in the neighborhood? Yeah, sure. So I would say that we should all lie low, hunker down, camp out at home. Um, I would not go to restaurants, movie theaters, um, bowling alleys, you know, groups of people. What I would say is stay at home. Yes, definitely go outside. Fresh air is probably a good thing. It has a very natural ability to disperse um, viruses and toxins and things like that. So absolutely go for a walk. But at the same time, don't walk up to somebody and start chatting with them. Keep at least six feet apart. Um, you know, keep your dogs away from other people because there's, it's possible that an pets might become infected and could eventually spread the virus. That's not absolutely known right now. But bottom line is, yeah, go outside if you want to go outside and exercise or walk in your yard, out in front. Uh, just don't congregate in these locations. But definitely, I have, I'm a strong believer that being outdoors is good for our health. There's actually evidence, scientific evidence, that being around greenery and trees uh, makes us feel better and actually improves our health. How about the gym? Is it safe to go there? Probably not a good idea. Granted, some people claim that, well, if I wipe down the equipment and I'm spaced at least six feet away from the next person, I don't think this is the time to be going to gyms and congregate settings. It's just not worth the risk. You know, a little bit of pain now and a lot of gain down the road. And as the Surgeon General impressed on us last week when he came here to Tulane, he impressed on us, this is the time to lean in, the time to make sacrifice, um, be inconvenienced, do the hard things that are hard to do, but that will pay off in two to four weeks because that will help to mitigate um, the severity of this ep epidemic. One of the things we've heard is that COVID-19 can permanently decrease our lung capacity. Is that true? And if so, is it permanent? Yeah, so there have been reports of that, and that doesn't really come as any surprise because if you're one of those um, few people, the minority who gets really sick and say has to go onto a ventilator machine and you say you develop adult respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, we've known for a long time that those people when they recover still have breathing issues, um, maybe not necessarily permanent damage, but, but long-term um, side effects. And so I think what's going to happen is in the next couple of months we're going to learn more about that as we start to follow those people over a period of months. I'm a big believer, though, in the power of rehab, physical therapy, um, taking care of oneself, and tincture of time. Some things that are reported to occur a few weeks after an illness get better. In fact, most things get better with time, and so I think there's still a lot of hope. But yes, there could be some permanent damage. Does COVID-19 cause any other sustained damage? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there may be some isolated reports of some other um, unusual complications. I, I, you know, I mean, the good news so far is that we, we haven't seen um, um, you know, damage to, say, um, um, the fetus in pregnant women, although it's still possible that that could occur as larger numbers of pregnant women become infected. Um, you know, there, there are always going to be a few outliers. There's going to be people that get meningitis or encephalitis and people that are going to get um, so other, other complications. But you know, at this point, they appear to be in the minority. Again, um, in the coming months, 
we'll have much better evidence or data um, to look at to see, tease out from thousands of patients what the clinical spectrum of this new disease is. Do we know how many people are able to carry the disease but not show symptoms? No. Um, and initially it was thought and certainly hoped that almost nobody without symptoms would be um, able to transmit, i.e. asymptomatic persons. There is a little bit of data now out there from around the world that it, it's probably possible for some people who haven't yet developed the cough or the fever, i.e. who still don't have symptoms, to transmit the virus. There are some, some uh, examples of some outbreaks in certain parts of the country uh, where they think this may be the case. Um, and so, you know, again, like every disease, nothing's 100%, nothing's 0%. Everything is, most things are shades of gray, and therefore, there probably will be some exceptions to the rule, and there will be some people who don't have symptoms. Sometimes people have symptoms and they don't talk about it. They don't say, yeah, I have a little, I have a cough, I have a low-grade fever. People tend to downplay things, so sometimes when you go back, you find out that, in fact, they did have symptoms. Either way, yes, I'm sure there are going to be some people that will spread it, but we're hoping and we think that at this point, it's really the people that are, that are sick and particularly the sicker patients who are the um, probably um, most capable of spreading the virus. Tulane University is currently working on new treatments, tests, and vaccines for COVID-19. Today, we're talking with Professor Bob Gary, an expert in infectious diseases. Let's start off with something basic. What is a coronavirus? Well, coronaviruses are a type of virus um, that we know uh, there are seven types that infect human beings. Three of these we know now cause pretty severe respiratory disease. Uh, four of them are viruses that cause diseases that are less severe, but they're still respiratory tract diseases. So more like the common cold. So is there a difference between coronavirus and COVID-19? Well, the coronavirus is, is the virus. The official name for that is um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, COVID-19 stands for coronavirus uh, disease in 2019, so COVID-19. So you'll hear both those terms, but COVID-19 is the disease, then we have other names for the virus. What other types of viruses is this one related to? It is not that far away from the virus that caused SARS back in 2003, 2002, 2003, 2004. Uh, there was a worldwide uh, spread and epidemic of SARS. And this virus is similar to that. It's uh, you know different in a lot of ways, so it, it spreads more easily. How do they behave differently? It behaves differently. Uh, it's not as deadly as the original SARS. Uh, right now, we believe that the uh, case fatality rate is somewhere around one percent. Now, that's a you know a mathematical term. Um, and when you actually look at how many people get infected and how many people die, it's probably less than 1%. So SARS was more like 10%. Um, so we still need to be concerned about this virus because it is spreading easier. So there are going to be more people infected. With the original SARS, there were only about 8,000 people uh, infected. We're well beyond that now. So uh, we have to be concerned about you know a more rapidly spreading virus still kills a substantial number of people, especially in the older age groups. Do we know the origins of the virus? This is one thing that um, my group and uh, some of my uh, colleagues have been looking at. Um, we know that the origin of this virus is different than the original SARS um, virus. Uh, that virus was actually a, a zoonosis. It's a disease that spreads from animals directly to humans. Uh, this virus definitely originated in animals, uh, probably bats and some other animals too. You probably heard on the news uh, talk about this uh, spiny anteater uh, that has uh, some viruses that are similar. So what we think is, is that this virus is a recombinant. It probably came from a bat virus, uh, plus perhaps one of these viruses from the pangolin. It recombined, the genetic material came together. And then it probably spread in humans for a while. We don't know how long. It could have been months, could have been decades of this virus spreading and evolving uh, in some other animal or humans. And then finally, just that one little mutation that occurred that allowed it to spread more rapidly. Then we saw the cases. We recognized this as a new disease. How does it go from animals to humans? It did go from animals to humans at some point. Uh, 
where the recombination occurred, we don't know. Um, but you know, ultimately, out in the wild, there are animals that have viruses that are similar. Bats, definitely. Uh, other animals, too. And there, this virus, though, is a new one that just came and started to infect people and cause this you know, pretty serious disease. What does this virus do in humans? Does it enter certain types of cells? It's a respiratory virus. Uh, and we're still learning uh, a lot about the pathology and the disease that's caused by this virus. But this virus does look like it can replicate not only in the upper respiratory tract, but in some people it gets down into the lower respiratory tract. And we know from other respiratory viruses, like influenza, that when that happens, uh, people can get in trouble. They can develop pneumonia. Uh, and, you know, if you can't control that pneumonia, then that's where you get the deaths. How does the virus spread from person to person? Well, I think there's uh, some good information out there and there's some information that's not so good. Uh, it definitely is a respiratory virus. So um, probably the most uh, common way that one gets it is if you're close to an infected person and they cough or sneeze and those droplets then you know, get into your space and you breathe them. That's probably the most common way. Um, there's also a possibility that you make smaller droplets and those droplets, you know, move in the air for a certain distance and then you breathe them in. You could also get the virus that way. That's called aerosol spread. We don't know the extent of that, but it certainly seems like that's possible with this virus. The other way that you can get the virus is if um, one of those droplets or smaller droplets land on a surface and then you touch it and then you touch your eye or put your finger in your mouth. People do that without even realizing that. Um, if you touch a mucous membrane, like the inside of your nose or your eye or the inside of your mouth, that's another way that the virus could spread. That's fomites. The CDC has told us that that's a fairly uncommon way for this virus to be spread. I agree with that uh, recommendation. I mean, you can prevent a lot of that by washing your hands, uh, but again, contrary to what you've seen on TV probably, just washing your hands is not going to stop this outbreak. What about common objects? So as opposed to the emphasis on the hand washing, which really probably isn't going to do too much uh, with this, I mean, it's not insignificant. I mean, there, that is one way that you can uh, get the virus. So we should wash our hands occasionally. Um, but, you know, 20 times a day is, an, is probably not going to help <laughs> that much. Um, what is going to help stop this outbreak uh, is the social distancing. So people staying in their homes, identifying people that are sick, getting them into care if they need it, or just, you know, keeping them in the home space so they don't infect other people, um, and just being aware that, you know, it, this is a virus that does spread from person to person. So if we limit that uh, interactions, we can probably stop this outbreak. Is there a difference in the amount of time COVID-19 can live on soft surfaces or hard surfaces? Um, there is a difference. Um, I mean, on a hard metal surface, it's probably a couple hours. Uh, if the surface is soft, like a piece of cardboard or something like that, it may be a little longer. I mean, there are some new studies that have come out that says that the virus can live on some of those more porous surfaces for over three days. So it's a pretty hardy virus, that's why it can spread that way by what we call the fomites or the surfaces, or it can live in the air for a longer time too. How contagious is COVID-19 compared to other illnesses we might be familiar with? Um, I think one could think about it as being approximately the same uh, level of infectiousness as uh, the seasonal flu, uh, which is a pretty uh, easily spread virus. It's not nearly as infectious as another uh, virus like uh, the, um, it's not as infectious as a virus like measles, um, where basically if an infected person walks into a room and there are 20 people in the room, 18 of those people would be infected. So um, it's, it's a pretty infectious virus. Who is most likely to get seriously ill? This virus most definitely affects people that are elderly. So if you're over even just 60, you're more likely to get the serious illness, particularly if you have an underlying condition, say a heart condition or a pulmonary condition, um, this virus uh, is a real threat to you. Is there currently a treatment or a vaccine for COVID-19? Um, there are no treatments uh, for it, specific treatments like drugs or vaccines. Um, 
but um, definitely if you come to a hospital, um, they will give you supportive care. If you need assistance breathing, they can put you on a ventilator. Uh, all these things can save lives. How do you develop treatments and vaccines? Well, the first thing we do is we learn about the virus. And so there is a history uh, of coronaviruses infecting humans. So there's quite a bit that we know about this uh, family of viruses. So when this new coronavirus came, this SARS-CoV-2, um, it was came with a, a good deal of information already uh, with the virus family. So um, the first thing we look at are the proteins. So a coronavirus is basically named because it has this unusual protein on its surface called the spike. Spike's important because that is the protein that lets the virus get into cells. It's also the protein that is going to be the one that's most likely to be put into a vaccine. So we already had a pretty good knowledge about coronavirus spike proteins, and we're going to leverage that information to uh, make vaccines. Um, we also knew about some of the other proteins in the virus, so the internal proteins like the nucleoproteins. We can probably use those to make diagnostics, and we've already started to express some of those proteins so that we can uh, put them into some diagnos diagnostics that might be able to be deployed faster and uh, used to you know, actually learn who has been infected by the virus. How do we test for the virus? Right now, uh, the testing is a little bit challenging um, because there aren't a lot of the tests that are available. But the tests that are available use uh, a technique that we call PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And this is going to detect the genetic parts of the virus, the, the RNA. And basically what you do is you amplify that RNA with an enzyme to the point where you can detect it with a machine. And so if the RNA is not there, you can't amplify it, the machine says no virus. If you amplify the RNA, uh, it gives you a signal and then you know that person is infected. Can our body naturally fight the virus? And if so, how? Different parts of your immune system that recognize invaders. So we have innate immunity uh, that we can um, express to uh, ward off viral invaders. Uh, things like interferon are produced, and um, you know these can help you control a virus. Um, and then we also have uh, acquired immunity. So when a foreign invader comes in, like this coronavirus, our body will start making defensive proteins like antibodies um, that will fight off the virus. Uh, we also have cells in our body that recognize virally infected cells and those can be activated uh, to help ward off the virus. Everybody does it a little dif differently. So most people that are infected with this virus, uh, will, their immune defenses will work pretty well and they'll have a pretty mild disease or even maybe no disease at all. Uh, other people, particularly some of us that may be a little older or a little weaker, have an underlying condition, uh, maybe our immune systems are a little compromised, we won't be able to fight the virus off as well. And that's, that's when people get in trouble and that's why they're at death from this virus. If I get COVID-19, am I more or less likely to get it again? Well, that's a, a point of discussion. Uh, it does seem there have been some people that got the virus, got the disease, recovered, and then they got it again. Uh, I would say that's probably pretty rare, or it's even possible that those cases that people have thought were cases were just cases of a false negative diagnosis the first time, they had some other respiratory disease, then they got the COVID-19. Can you tell us more about what other people at Tulane are doing around COVID-19? So one of the important projects is at the Tulane National Primate Center. Uh, this is a wonderful s facility there. They have the Biosafety Level 3 lab. So they're developing animal models for the disease. This is absolutely critical uh, to develop those countermeasures, uh, the vaccines, the drugs against the virus. Um, there are also um, efforts to make diagnostics, different ways to make them. Um, we have a very good group here that's making rapid diagnostic tests. So this will be important to be able to uh, do diagnosis on the spot. So a person doesn't have to wait two or three days to get a result from the test. You'll know in just a few minutes. 
We hear a lot of different terms. Can you tell us a little bit more about therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines? A diagnostic uh, is the way that we detect the virus. So usually this involves making some kind of an assay. Uh, the common assays now are these um, polymerase chain reaction assays, um, but they help you detect is the person uh, carrying the virus in their body. Uh, other types of tests would be for antibodies where you could then say the person made an immune response and you could tell that person was infected at some time in the past. Um, the vaccines are preventatives. So these are um, proteins usually uh, or even uh, attenuated viruses that are given to people and they artificially stimulate the person's specific immunity to the virus. And so then if the person is exposed to the virus uh, for the first time, the real virus, your body's immune system is already activated and you can fight it off better. Therapeutics are drugs. So uh, these are antivirals that would interact with the virus or some enzyme of the virus or the surface of the virus, something to uh, affect the virus so it can't cause the disease. Next up is Dr. Jay Rappaport, the director of the Tulane National Primate Research Center, where they're working to make safe and effective vaccines. Has the Tulane National Primate Research Center, or TNPRC, done research to combat viruses and infectious diseases before COVID-19? Our research, about 65% of it, is focused on, on HIV, AIDS. We do vaccine work. We've contributed to uh, many of the drugs that are currently you know, the development of the drugs that are currently used in therapeutics for AIDS. Uh, we have other uh, avenues of research where we work on Lyme disease. Um, Lyme, the test for Lyme in humans and animals was developed at TNPRC. We're developing newer diagnostics and treatments for Lyme and even post-treatment Lyme disease. Um, we have, uh, we're doing research on aging, uh, Alzheimer's disease. We have, uh, we're really expanding our portfolio into many different areas. We've done work on Zika virus in the past, uh, other pathogens. Uh, our major strength is infectious disease at the Primate Center. And we have the only, we're the only national primate center that has a regional biocontainment laboratory. This biocontainment laboratory is, is at the level that is, is needed for work with uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. We have the largest capacity at, at this level, at what's called biosafety level three in the country. Um, and uh, we're highly suited to do this sort of work. We have, a, we have aerobiology, which we can, we can really study what the particle size it carries the virus. We can see if it's stopped by masks or if you need a respirator. Uh, we can determine if the sequence changes before and after infection uh, by looking at, at the RNAs or proteins within, uh, within the infected animals or the infected cells. Uh, we can measure immune responses and determine which ones are protective and which ones may be harmful. Uh, there are so many things that we have the, cap the capabilities to do. Uh, and I think that's the work we can do, I think, would most rapidly move the field forward in terms of generating th therapeutics that work, vaccines that were effective, and diagnostics that could best pick up infected individuals and prevent the spread. We all hear that the TNPRC is a tremendous asset, especially when combating infectious diseases. Why? Well, actually, we were founded, uh, you know, in, to combat infectious disease. That's really our major strength. We have enormous strengths in immunology, uh, virology, uh, and in terms of our capabilities, uh, of the seven national primate centers, we are the only one that has a regional biocontainment uh, uh, laboratory at biosafety level three. So we can actually work with pathogens that are dangerous, uh, and we have the largest capacity actually in the, in the country, possibly in the world. 
So how is a non-human primate model better than other animal models? The immune system in non-human primates is very similar to that in humans. And we've seen that in our AIDS vaccine studies and a number of other studies. There's been many studies that have been done in mice that don't translate uh, into work in humans. In other words, dr there are many drugs that have come out of, uh, or even vaccines that have come out of mouse studies that prove they're, un they're not effective when you move into a non-human primate or human model. So the non-human primate model is the best and, would, and will you know, likely save lots of time in terms of you know, finding the, vaccine, the right vaccine that's going to work and the right vaccine to then test and then ultimately deploy into human beings. So we hear that people like those over 60 are more likely to be at risk. Is the TMPRC focused on any special risk groups? Our initial studies on the animal model are actually focused in older animals for that reason. We want to have the best model that best recapitulates what goes on in human beings, so our initial focus will be the, the uh, aged animals. We, ha we have uh, a colony of rhesus macaques that's supported by the National Institute of Aging, so we have animals at, at many different ages, and so we're going to be using some of these animals, and we also have African green monkeys where we're going to use some older animals too for the same reason. And then we can compare young versus old and really see what the uh, effective aging is. Will there be a non-human primate model for COVID-19? Uh, it looks like in the rhesus model that uh, the, the, it looks like the uh, infection doesn't cause a really severe disease, but we're hoping that the African green monkeys are better and give, and give that more severe pathology that we're looking for. At the same time, we're planning strategies that will enhance the disease in the, in, in the rhesus or the African green. We have several strategies planned to create the best model possible. Other than the model, does the TNPRC have any other kind of research that can be useful for COVID-19? We're doing studies on uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines in those three different categories. Uh, we have multiple approaches that are planned. We can, uh, there are RNA-based approaches, protein-based approaches. Uh, it looks for vaccines that, because the antibodies appear to be protective, that uh, an RNA-based approach or protein-based approach could be highly effective um, as a vaccine. There are multiple companies now that are lined up with therapeutics that they want to test uh, with us. Uh, there are, and also there are investigators here at Tulane that have strategies that they want to test uh, in, in vitro in the primate model. Uh, so yeah, we're really working at, at multiple uh, avenues. Uh, Tony Hu, Dr. Hu, uh, has been working with the Primate Center to uh, develop uh, an, a highly sensitive test for COVID-19 uh, from plasma. There's a lot of concern nationally about the use of animals in research. Can you talk a little bit about that and talk about how the animals are cared for? Okay, this is extremely important uh, to develop treatments and diagnostics, vaccines for infectious diseases. This particular infection with this coronavirus uh, I think underscores the need to use non-human primates and animal models. We have the best animal care available in the country. So uh, we're, we're really, uh, we treat the animals extremely well and we care for them and we care about them. And we're here with Janine Dabon from the Tulane University Wellness Clinic. We're going to get some practical tips today for how to protect yourselves and your community from COVID-19. To start, let's talk about hand washing. It's all anybody can talk about. What do we need to know? Hand washing is one of the best and easiest ways for you to help prevent the spread of this virus. Uh, one of the things w people want to know is how long should I wash my hands? And so the current recommendation is that you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. So how do you get through washing your hands for 20 seconds? Maybe think of the song Happy Birthday and sing the first verse of Happy Birthday. Who can be infected and who is at risk for getting sick? 
So when we're talking about the coronavirus and who can be infected by the virus, many people, everyone is at risk. However, there are specific groups that we concern ourselves with, and that is folks, for example, that have lung disease, diabetes, or they are taking medication that potentially can compromise their immune system and makes their immune system weak. So we're concerned about those folks specifically. And with that in mind, if you are sick, you should really stay at home and stay out of the way of the healthy folks. So if I'm not in a high risk category, is it safe to go out to the grocery store, to the park? What should I be doing? Well, we want to kind of consider everyone and keeping everyone safe. So if you are in a low risk category, you want to think about, you know, protecting yourself, practicing good hand washing, because if we protect the society, then what we're actually, in fact, doing is protecting or preventing the virus from spreading to others in the community. What can we do to help slow the spread of the virus? How do we protect ourselves and others? So although you may not be considered high risk and you're in a low risk category, it still is important to think of the community um, that we are living in. And so things that we enjoy doing, like going to large concerts, large festivals, Mardi Gras just happened and you know we did have a lot of thousands of people in town. And so you wanna think about, okay, how can I best be a good participant in the community. And that's by avoiding participating in large um, events like that. And really, if you're sick, stay home. What are some precautions we can take if we're around people who are at risk for getting seriously ill? And what are some precautions for those who are increased risk that they can purge? So the recommendations are constantly changing when it comes to what we consider large groups. So, you know, we think about large events like when we have big festivals. Um, so the current recommendation, however, is for 50 or less in a group. So sometimes we have a large business meeting, large um, conferences. Those are the things that, if you've noticed, they have started to be limited. There's a lot of talk about what we can do to help curb this disease. What about things that we should not do? So on an individual basis, some of the things that we want to consider and we always are tempted to do is still try to make it to work when we're not feeling that well. So really at this point, if you are feeling sick in any way, you should try to stay at home absolutely practicing good hand washing, good ha hand hygiene, and just overall good hygiene. Like if you blow your nose, go wash your hands. If you touch your face, go wash your hands. Um, and then also we go back to the social distancing. In our community, we love to be really close and congregate. Try to keep those in mind. And then as a community, we want to think about avoiding hosting large events, avoiding going to large conferences. But since everybody else is, do I need to stock up on toilet paper? You know, there's really not a need or cause for us to go out and over purchase toilet paper. You know, we need to be commonsensical about this and purchase just the items that we need for our home. We are having to stay at home a little bit more than usual. So think about, okay, I'm at home maybe every day instead of going into work. So just think about it in a common sense way. I have a runny nose and I don't feel good. Do I need to go to the hospital and be tested? A few things that you should avoid doing when um, thinking about trying to curb this disease is so we talked about handshaking, hugging, um, stay at home if you're sick. So if you're still having to go into work, stay at home if you know that you've developed a fever, you have a cough, um, those types of things, staying away. Um, don't go around other folks who are at higher risk. So if you are in a situation where you have um, elderly that live in your home, folks that are over the age of 65, or you know that have some type of compromised condition, you may wanna limit the contact with those folks. As well as one thing that has been really popular lately is you've been seeing a lot of folks go to the grocery store and hoard supplies and hoard food. And really we should think if we all just buy just what we need, then we'll have enough for everyone. Can you explain why we've canceled events and closed schools, et cetera? What does this do for us? We're seeing a lot of cancellations of schools. We're seeing a lot of camp people staying at home from work. So what is that doing for us? What it's actually doing is helping us 
prevent or better for a better lack of word, limit the spread of the virus because when we're all together and we're congregating that gives us a big opportunity if somebody's coughing if someone's sneezing to spread the virus in a more rapid manner versus let's hey let's have everyone stay at home let's have the kids stay at home let's do um, distance work distance learning so that we're not putting everyone at risk and as a community that should st start to help us limit the exposure of those in our community. This isn't the last time you'll hear from us, and we want to know what questions you have. So please email us at medquestions at tulane.edu.